in our hymn books to the paraphrase number two. The paraphrase number two, the page is 143. O God of Beth, O by whose hand thy people still are fed, who through this weary pilgrimage hast all our fathers led. Just while I remember as well, hopefully all of you will have found these in your pews this morning, as we mentioned at the prayer meeting the other night. Uh, we were going to leave them in your pews and take them with you, put them in a place in your home where you can remember to pray. And that uh, form is also there if you're wishing to help even further in any way with sponsorship of a child or any needs that may arise. So do take those with you and even use them at home. Paraphrase number two, please. blessing once again. Let me encourage you each and every heart and each and every head bowed before the Lord. Let's seek his presence. Father in heaven, we do gather before thee even at this time and it is our earnest prayer that above all this day that thy name will be hallowed. That thy name, O God, will be glorified. We bow before the great God of heaven and of earth. We do thank and praise thee for the new and living way in which we can access the throne room of heaven. We do not come with a lamb or with a bullock to present it to a priest, to make an offering on our behalf. We thank and praise thee for the great high priest, who has made that one-time sacrifice for our sin, who has entered into the Holy of Holies on our behalf. We thank thee for his seating at thy right hand. We do rejoice in the intercession which he makes for us. We thank thee that we can approach the throne of grace. We can cry unto thee, Abba, Father. We can talk with thee even as friend unto friend. We thank and praise thee for our standing in Christ Jesus. 
We do rejoice in the declaration of our righteousness even before thee. We thank and praise thee, O God, that that slate has been wiped clean and we've been declared righteous in thy sight. We thank thee for our righteousness. We thank thee that the Lord Jesus Christ is the God-man himself. He is the one who has bridged that gap between heaven and earth. He is the one, O God, who even has made that peace and made that, Lord, fellowship once again with thee possible. We thank thee for his death. And even as we gather on the first day of the week, we rejoice in his resurrection. We have so much to thank and to praise thee for. We have so much to give thee reverence and humble praise and adoration for. O oh God, we do pray that thou wilt empty us all of self and of sin. And fill us with thy spirit this day as we have gathered to thy house. O Lord, thou knowest the needs of every heart. Thou knowest the needs of every individual, every family. Thou knowest the burdens that have been carried even this day. Lord, worries and concerns for loved ones. Lord, worries and concerns for family members. And Lord, we just pray that each one will be cast at the feet of Christ. The great burden bearer himself will lift us up and will encourage us and will strengthen us and give us that peace of heart. Oh Lord, remember each one in these days for good, we pray thee. Remember even the work of this church. We thank thee, or we think of what has already been accomplished this morning and we do thank thee for the Sabbath school and for each child and young person that was gathered out. We thank thee for that help that was given to thy servants once again. And Lord, that that word that has been sown, that it will fall upon the good ground, that it will bring forth much fruit. O Lord, bless, we pray thee, every aspect of this work. We do think of the online children's work. We think of the youth work. We think, O oh God, of the services each Sabbath day. We think of the midweek prayer time. We think, O oh God, of our session, of our committee. Lord, of each and every one that is involved in the work of this church, we pray that thy hand of blessing will be upon us for good. We pray that in the days that lie ahead, that souls will be saved, that backsliders will be restored. O oh God, we think of our land in these days. We think of the great and the many needs that there are. We think, O oh God, of the political needs. We think of the social needs the mental, the physical needs. O oh God, we think above all of the spiritual need. And O oh Father, that thou wilt come down in mighty power. Thou wilt work in our land and work in the hearts. That thou wilt draw many souls unto thee, we pray thee. Lord, do bless in these days our denomination as a whole. Bless our moderator and our office bearers. Bless each and every church, each and every minister in session. Each and every one that is involved in the work of Jesus Christ. Bless our college. Bless our missionaries. Lord, be with them and bless those that are out in the field at this time. Lord, so distant as it were because of the shutdowns and because of the various circumstances, we just commit each one into thy hands. Lord, that thou wilt be near to them. That thou wilt bless them. Remember our elderly. Lord, those unable to join with us anymore, we do. Bring them afresh to thee this day. We pray for thy blessing to be upon them. We pray for thy hand to be round about. And O oh God that I will encourage them in their own souls. Lord do you remember the need in relation to this virus. O oh God that I will blow upon it. Lord we look and we have watched over these months. Lord we, we just bring it to thee because we realize vain is the help of man. O oh God our confidence, our trust, our hope is in the Lord himself. We do think of those words of Second Chronicles. My people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and turn from their wicked ways. Pray. O oh God, thou hast promised to hear from heaven. Thou hast promised to forgive their sin and to heal the land. And O oh God, we look at the need for healing and we realize that thou hast not changed. Thou art the same yesterday, today, and forever. And, O God, thy promises are yea and amen in Christ Jesus. And so if the power of God is still there, then surely the people of God have not turned. O Father, humble us, we pray thee. And bring us to your knees in prayer. Work in our hearts. 
O God, soften us and fill us with thy spirit. Lord, may there be that word in season for each of us today. May there be that word of exhortation for the lost as well. That men and women, boys and girls who will hear the sound of God's word throughout this day will be broken. And Lord, brought to Christ, we pray thee. Lord, draw near, we pray. Hedge us round about in the precious blood. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. 373 is our second hymn this morning. You'll find it on the page 327, the hymn 373. He is not a disappointment. Jesus is far more to me than in all my glowing daydreams I had fancied he could be. 373, and we'll stand after the introduction, please. Stand as we sing. Oh uh-huh. 
Bibles now in the Psalms as we continue reading together through them week by week. Psalm 79. <coughs> the Psalm 79. Simply entitled, A Psalm of Asaph. Psalm 79, beginning at the verse 1. O God, the heathen are come into thine inheritance. Thy holy temple have they defiled. They have laid Jerusalem on heaps. The dead bodies of thy servants have they given to be meat unto the fowls of the heaven and the flesh of thy saints unto the beasts of the earth. Their blood have they shed like water round about Jerusalem, and there is none to bury them. We are become a reproach to our neighbours, a scorn and derision to them that are round about us. How long, Lord, wilt thou be angry forever? Shall thy jealousy burn like fire? Pour out thy wrath upon the heathen that have not known thee, and upon the kingdoms that have not called upon thy name. For they have devoured Jacob, and laid west, waste his dwelling place. O remember not against us former iniquities, that thy tender mercies speedily prevent us, for we are brought very low. Help us, O God of our salvation. For the glory of thy name, and deliver us, and purge away our sins, for thy name's sake. Wherefore should the heathen say, Where is their God? Let him be known among the heathen in our sight, by the revenging of the blood of thy servants which is shed. Let the sign of the prisoner come before thee. According to the greatness of thy power, preserve thou those that are appointed to die. And render unto our neighbours sevenfold, and to their bosom their reproach, wherewith they have reproached thee, O Lord. So we, thy people, and sheep of thy pasture, will give thee thanks forever. We will show forth thy praise to all generations. Amen. And may the Lord write his own blessing upon the reading of his precious word. 182. As our next hymn we'll sing together this morning, 182, the page is 250. Break thou the bread of life, dear Lord, to me, as thou didst break the bread beside the sea. The hymn 182, please. And let's stand again as we sing. Break by the bread of life, dear Lord, to me, as I did break the bread,
Let's open our Bibles now, please, in 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings in the chapter 17. As we continue to move our way along with Elijah through his life, we come to the next part of it, beginning at the verse number 8. As we consider this morning the family for Elijah. The family for Elijah. The verse 8 down to the end of the verse 16. Verse King 17 to verse 8. And the word of the Lord came unto him saying. Arise and get thee to Sarephath which belongeth to Sidon. And dwell there. Behold I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Sarephath. And when he came to the, city, or to the gate of the city, behold, a widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water and a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but an handful of meal, and a barrel, and a little oil, and a cruise, and behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and for my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, bring it unto me. And after make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste. Neither shall the cruise of oil fail until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah. And she and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail. According to the word of the Lord which he spake by Elijah. Amen. Let's have a moment's prayer please before we come around God's word. Father, we just look to thee now for thy help and for the infilling afresh of thy spirit. We thank thee, O God, for thy presence and thy help thus far in this meeting. We thank thee for the hymns that we've been able to sing together and to worship thee even with our singing. We thank thee for thy word that we have read. Oh, what a blessing it is to know that each and every word within this book is truth and is settled in heaven forever. Oh, Lord, even now as we have opened up thy book, as we come to the preaching part of the service, Lord, we pray for thy spirit to work. O oh, spirit of the living God, fall afresh. Break us, melt us, and fill us. O oh, come amongst us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. George Mueller, the founder of the Bristol Orphanages, was relating to a friend some of the difficulties that he had to contend with in providing for the orphans and providing with them with food every single day. When he had finished speaking, his friend turned to him and said, George, you seem to live from hand to mouth. Yes, said George Mueller, it's my mouth, but it's the Lord's hand. And certainly that can be said of Elijah in those three and a half years after he had preached that sermon of judgment to Ahab. We looked last week as he was sent first of all to Cherith to hide at that brook. And now we read the Lord is moving him on to Sarephath to stay there. It was Watchman Nee that said because of our pruneness to look at the bucket and forget the fountain. God has frequently to change his means of supply to keep our eyes fixed upon the source. And how true that is, we can be just come so comfortable and we can end up looking just at what we have instead of looking at who the person is that has given us all of the blessings and all of the provisions. And that was the case even for the Israelites, and the children of God and throughout the scriptures. You remember whenever the nation of Israel entered into the promised land in Joshua 5 and the verse 12, it tells us that the manna ceased. The Lord had provided for them their 40 years in the wilderness. Every day the manna came from heaven. It came 
that double portion on the Friday, so on the Sabbath they didn't have to collect. But whenever they came into the promised land, the manna ceased. Why? Because then the Lord provided through the fruit and all that was in the land of Canaan itself. Even in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, the chapter 4, the verse 34, it tells us that all in the church in Jerusalem lacked nothing. They all had needed, what they needed was supplied. They sold their land, they gave the money into the church, and it was carried out and provided even for the widows, and everyone was cared for. And yet, whenever you come to Acts 11, in the verses 27 to 30, it tells us that the church in Antioch had to send up provision and supplies to the church in Jerusalem. Yes, Jerusalem was still being provided for that church, but now it wasn't a case that they were looking to their own means. Now they had to trust the Lord completely, and the help had to come from outside. Every need is always met by the Lord. This was no different for Elijah. As I said last week, the Lord could have provided him water out of a rock. Just as it had happened for Moses and the Israelites, Elijah could have lifted a stick, lifted a rod, and struck one of the rocks, and water could have come forth from it for three and a half years. The ravens could have kept coming with their bread and flesh, but yet now the Lord is commanding him, Elijah, move on. No longer will you stay at Cherith, no longer will the ravens come. Now it's time to go again. We're coming to test number three. The third test in Elijah's life at that time. And the Lord came and he said to him, I have provided a family. You're going to be sustained there by a widow woman, the verse 9 tells us. A place of refuge once again. There are three things I want you to see in relation to this family I was there for Elijah. When you see firstly the verse 9, the place of the family. The place of the family. The Lord says to him, Arise, get thee to Sarephath, which belongeth to Sidon, and dwell there. What an instruction for Elijah to receive. Once again, it brought about a change in Elijah's life. The man who was told to hide is now told to come out of hiding and to go to Sarephath. But there are two things I want you to see in relation to Zarephath. First of all, Zarephath is a place of danger. It was dangerous, first of all, to get there. The distance from Cherith to Zarephath was 100 miles. Elijah was going to have to walk for 100 miles through the land of Israel, Samaria, in a time whenever Ahab and his forces were actively seeking for him means every single day whenever Elijah started his onward journey, and no doubt it took at least a week for him to make that hundred mile journey. And every single day as he walked step after step, mile after mile, from Cherith to Sarephath, Ahab and his men were going about, looking in every town, every village, every hamlet, for the prophet Elijah. And then to go to Sarephath itself, He's going into enemy territory. He's going to the city and the area of Sidon over which Ahab's father-in-law was king. 1 Kings 16 verse 31 tells us that it came to pass as if it had been a light thing, this is speaking of Ahab, for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam the son of Nebat that he took to wife Jezebel, his daughter of Ethbeel, king of the Sidonians. And now the Lord is saying to Elijah, Elijah, I want you to go to Sarephath. It's in Sidon. In other words, Elijah, I want you to go to enemy territory. Why? Because that's where you're going to be fed. Out of all of the areas, out of all of the places that Elijah could have went, the Lord sends him into the mouth of the lion. He could have sent them, go up into the mountains of Gilead. The brave men will take care of you. Your own people will watch over you. No. Or go to the other places, those that absolutely hate Ahab. Remember David did that. He went to the Philistines. He hid down with the Philistines. But no, Elijah, I want you to go to the very mouth of the lion. I want you to go to Jezebel's father's kingdom and to his city. 
You know, I wonder today if the Lord came to us and said, I want you to move to Iran or Pakistan. I want you to move to North Korea. I wonder how many would be getting the suitcases down. If we were being sent to a place where we know that the Christian is actively harmed and persecuted and where the government is putting their forces into place and even China as well where the government is putting into place their forces to go against the Christian to shut down the church to persecute the preachers to round up the Christians and throw them into jail and yea even worse I wonder how many of us would be getting the suitcases down. That's what Elijah was faced with. And yet Elijah is told, go to Zarephath. I've prepared, number one, a woman there. And number two, that's where you're going to get your food. You know, there are nations in this world, and I've mentioned them, if we weren't, went to them to preach the gospel, if we went to them to live out the gospel before them even, as we looked at in Acts last week, that practical Christianity, walking in the footsteps of Christ, speaking like Christ, living like Christ, treating others like Christ. Without any fear, those nations could turn and torture and kill us for it. And yet Elijah went to the kingdom of Ethel. Because remember, Eth feels just as much against Elijah as Jezebel was. And if Eth had have found out, even for one instance, if one person had have came to Eth and said, Elijah's hiding out in your own city, I guarantee you this, every single man in the army of Eth would have been down to that house to take him. And they would have killed him. All around him, whenever he went to that lady's house, were forces that were desirous of death and evil. You know, it just reminds me of the cross of Christ. Because Elijah was going to be surrounded by all of the forces of evil. And what does it tell us of our Lord and Savior when he hung upon the cross? Psalm 22, verse 12, many bulls have compassed me, yea, the strong bulls of Bashan. Psalm 22, verse 16, the dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. And even through Elijah moving into that area, you see a picture of Christ. Because for Christ at the cross, it was darkness, it was wickedness all around. There wasn't one familiar, friendly face. Because, of course, he said to Mary and to the disciple he loved, Mary, behold thy son, or mother, behold thy son, son, behold thy mother, and they left. And all of the widows were standing afar off. And right around the cross of Christ were all of the soldiers tearing up his clothes. And yet our Lord and Saviour, with the foreknowledge of what was coming, he still set his face as a flint. My Elijah didn't have the foreknowledge of God, did he? He had no idea what would happen in Sarephah. But yet he still had faith in God. You know, not one of us knows what holds, what the future holds for us. The Lord takes us step by step, doesn't he? And he simply asks us to walk by faith, not by sight. And Elijah there, he's been given that direction. Elijah, I've kept you at Cherif. You've been fed. The ravens have come every single day. Now, Elijah, it's time to move on. Are you willing to go to Sarephath? No, Elijah was, or Sarephath was a place of danger, but I want you to see also it was a place of dearth. It was like Israel, Sidon was also affected by this drought and by this famine. We read that even as the woman is coming out, there's no rain, there's no dew is being experienced in that country. The little lady, she's going out, she's collecting two sticks. Why? Because she has nothing left. She comes out and she tells Elijah, Elijah, I'm lifting these two sticks. I've got enough for one more meal and then me and my son, we're both going to die. 
And yet that's exactly what Elijah was saying. You know, at no point did Elijah experience a comfortable, relaxing, safe residence, did he? The Lord never once moved him to a castle. Told him, hide away in this castle, and this man in the castle is going to protect you and provide your every need. You're going to live fit for a king as everyone outside is struggling. No, Elijah was in the midst of the struggle every single step. That's important to highlight, child of God, because being in the will of God does not mean an easy and a gentle life. Just because we're following and obeying the will of God does not mean that suddenly everything's a bed of roses. But it's the best life. I love that little phrase, God's will will never send you somewhere where God's grace can't keep you. How true that is. God's will will never send you to a place where God's grace can't keep you. Even if that means danger and hardship, the Lord's going to be with you. 2 Corinthians 12 and 9, My grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. The place for Elijah. But Then secondly, I want you to see the people in the family as well. The verse 9. The people... In the family. First Kings 17 to verse 9 it says. Arise get thee to Sarephath which belongeth to Zidon. And dwell there. Behold I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. You know it's wonderful as always. God's leading so clear. Whenever the Lord leads you in your life. He never leaves you to question it. And to doubt it. Whenever the Lord is clearly leading. He clearly gives you that perfect direction. That perfect instruction. He comes to Elijah. He says Elijah arise. You're going to Sarephath, number one. Number two, here's where you're going to stay. You're looking for a widow woman. I've already worked in her heart. She's going to sustain you. You know, it's interesting, this lady that he sent to. Because as we've just highlighted at the end of verse 9, she's a prepared woman. You know, it's wonderful because unbeknown to Elijah, as he sat there at, the, at Brook Cherith, the Lord was already working in a lady's heart. As Elijah sat there every morning and every evening drinking as that water as it went down and down until there was but a puddle left as the ravens came in every day with the bread and flesh. Yet Elijah's sitting there waiting patiently and looking to the Lord and unbeknown to him there's a woman's heart who's being touched. There's a woman's heart who's being changed. And so Elijah comes to Zarephath as he comes to that city, he has no idea who this woman is. I would suspect that Elijah had never been in the city of Sarephath before in his life. He would have no reason to go there before. Elijah, as he comes into that city, I'm sure within his heart, he's, he's just simply looking to the Lord and praying to the Lord, Well, Lord, who is this woman? Where do I find this woman? What will she look like? Where will I find her house? How will we come into contact one with the other? So as it were, he puts out a fleece. He asks the first woman he sees for a drink. Any other woman would have said no. Because the Jews and the Samaritans have no dealings one with the other. Jewish people and Gentile people never mix. That's highlighted for us in John 4 and 9 whenever Christ comes to the well. And so the fact that Elijah asked the question, will you go and get me a drink? The fact that she's going to get it shows to Elijah this is the woman. Because any other woman would have went, no, I'm having nothing to do with you. You know, it reminds us of Abraham's servant in Genesis 24, doesn't it? Remember, Abraham sends his servant to find a wife for Isaac. In Genesis 24, the verses 12 to 14, it tells us as he comes into that city, the, or the, the servant, he's praying and he says, O Lord God of my master Abraham, 
Genesis 21 to verse 12, I pray thee, send me good speed this day, and show kindness unto my master Abraham. Behold, I stand here by the well of water, and the daughters of the men of the city come out to draw water. Let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, let down thy pitcher, I pray thee that I may drink. And she shall say, drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. Let the same be, be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac. He laid out the fleece. Elijah lays out the fleece. Elijah gave that question, that bidding, that invitation to her, would you please go and get me a drink of water? The woman goes. You see, whenever God is guiding us and leading us, whenever we're seeking his perfect will for our life, He's the one that brings everything together. You know, too often, child of God, we try and force doors open. Too often in our lives, we look to the Lord and we say, right, Lord, what's your will for us? And the Lord starts to give us that lead in that direction. He shows us where to go. Instead of letting the Lord bring every single aspect, every single little point, even the tiniest sub-points, if you want to call them that, and let him bring them all together, we start and we try and gel them together ourselves. And we try and start and try and force a door open here and shut a door closed there. And yet whenever it's the Lord bringing it all together, that's the perfection. Elijah here, as he walked into that city, he simply looked into the Lord to lead him in the way that he's to go. He's looking for the prepared woman. And she's a prepared woman, she's also a poor woman. In verse 12, it says, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal and a barrel, a little oil and a cruise, and behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. I say this respectfully, but what a pathetic picture. What a very sad picture. Elijah's coming into this city. He's asked for a drink. And she goes to give him a drink of water. And he says, oh, could you get me something to eat as well? She says, I have enough to make one meal for me and my son. Then we're completely out of food. And we're going to die. Before Elijah is standing a woman with no hope. No money. No food. And yet Elijah. Still believes this is a woman. That the Lord has prepared. To sustain me. You know, many Christians would have turned around at that point and somebody said, oh, sorry to bother you, I must have got the wrong one. I'm looking for a woman that's going to be able to feed me for the next couple of years. You've got one meal and then you're out. And yet Elijah says there, no, 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 he says, I still believe in the Lord. You know, the human aspect would have looked at that woman. There's a little tiny widow woman. She's simply got two sticks in her hand. She tells him, I've got one bit of meal and one bit of oil. I'm going to make one last meal for me and my son. Then we're going to starve to death. And I just says, you, you go and get me the food. You know, here's the test for Elijah, not only to go to that city, but even to stay with her. He hears her words, he looks at the woman before him, he sees a woman of abject poverty. But yet he knows his God in heaven is the richest God and the greatest God that provides every need. Remember the hymn, little is much when God's in it. We can look at just a little meal and a little oil and say, what's that? Isn't that what was said whenever the feeding of the 5,000? Lord, I've got five loaves and I've got two fishes. What's that amongst so many? Lord says, give me it. I'll show you. And I'll feed all of the 5,000 men plus the women plus the children. You'll have to go around and lift 12 baskets full of food afterwards because there's going to be so much left over. 
This woman says, I've got one bit of meal, I've got one bit of oil, I've got one meal left. Elijah says, no, no, you give that to the Lord. You know, this family had nothing except one thing. They had the promise of God's sustenance. That's all that woman had. She had nothing. She could look in her cupboards or in her house or her neighbours or the shop. She didn't have anything. She only had one thing. The promise of God. But here's the thing. What more did she need? She was a prepared woman. She was a poor woman. Just to highlight this to you before we move on. She was a pagan woman. You look at the words that she says. In the verse 12. She says, as the Lord, look at this next word, thy God liveth. She doesn't speak. Because remember Elijah said in the verse 1, he says, as the Lord God of Israel liveth. He knew he, who he was. This woman said, as the Lord, thy God liveth. In other words, he's not my God, he's your God. And yet the Lord has prepared this woman. Even though she's unsaved, the Lord, she's still in the Lord's hand. He can still turn her whatever way he so desires. And yes, she knows the truth. We've highlighted over the weeks, people were being taught in those days, God of Israel, Jehovah's dead. Baal's alive, and yet this woman knows the truth. No, your God's alive. I know he's alive. But he's only your God. And yet the Lord takes her, takes her in his hand. He just turns her whatever way he so desires. Now what he did was Cyrus, a man who was used by God to free the Israelites from Babylon, he was a pagan king. And yet the Lord described him in Isaiah 44, 28, he's my shepherd who shall perform all of my pleasure. The Lord spoke of him in Isaiah 45 in the verse 1. His anointed desirous whose right hand I have hidden are holding to subdue nations. See, we look at the emperors, we look at the kings, the presidents, the prime ministers. Ungodly men and women right across the world ruling nations and changing laws. Each one of them the Lord can take and the Lord can turn. why we're to pray for them that's why the book of Romans commands us to pray for those in authority that they would be given the wisdom and yea they would be turned and their hearts would be turned you know it's wonderful it's wonderful whenever we consider who our God is there is nothing and there is no one that is too big or too strong for the Lord. And you look at the size of the nations in our world today. You look at the size and the power that they have. You look at America. You look at China. You look at Russia. You look at India. Iran. Massive nations. Huge armies. With all of their arsenal of weaponry. And all of the might, the power, the influence that they have upon other nations. And yet those dictators, presidents, whatever the case may be in each individual country, the Lord just says, they're in my hand. And I can turn. Elijah had a place to go to and he had a family or a people to care for him. But one thing, just as we close this morning, I want you to see the provision for him. Indeed, for the family, the verse 14. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil, oil fail until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. It was wonderful. I was thinking the other night in the, in the prayer meeting, whenever the slides were going through, and we seen the aid that had been given to the, to the people out there in Uganda. Our brother Egan mentioned about he, th he it looked like a petrol can. It just reminded me, there's the meal and there's the oil. 
That's all they had. They were, each person was given that bag with the meal and with the oil in it. But here was the thing. The people in Uganda would have used it and then they would have needed more. This woman had enough for one meal and yet what was the thing that was said to her? It's going to last you until the rain comes. But do you see what happened first before that promise was given? She told Elijah, she says, I have enough for one meal. One meal for two people. That's it. Elijah says, give it to me. He doesn't say, go and feed yourself first. He says, firstly, you've only enough for two people for one meal. Right, you give me mine. That's selfish. Was Elijah's stomach talking before his heart? No, you see, this was Elijah speaking on behalf of the Lord. He was the Lord's messenger. He was the representative, as it were, for the Lord at that time. He was representing the Lord, and he said, on behalf of the Lord, you give me first. You give the Lord first. And if you give the Lord first, the Lord is going to care for you every single day. You remember the widow, Luke 21? Christ is there in the temple with his disciples. He's watching them all coming in and throwing their offerings into the plate and into the treasury. And the Pharisees, they come in with their pomp and their ceremony and they're basically emptying their bucket loads in. And the wee woman comes in just with two mites. She drops them both in. And the Lord note, took note of her. The Lord commanded her and the Lord blessed her. Did he once turn around and say, would you look at how much the Pharisees are? Aren't they great people? They've given their bucketfuls in. No, he says, look at that wee woman. She's given all she could. Her two mites are worth more than all of the thousands or shekels and all that these men are throwing in. Why? She's given it all. She's given all. And here the Lord is saying through Elijah to this woman, you give everything to me. And I'll give you everything you need. Child of God, that's all the Lord wants of us. And on see if that's all the Lord wants of you. Number one, he wants your heart. He says in Proverbs, my son, give me your heart. If you give the Lord your heart, you're giving him your all. Because the heart rules the head and rules the body. Child of God, he then says to us, give him his, give us, or give him our talents. Give him our strengths. Give him our tithes. Give him our all. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Trust the Lord with all your heart and lean not in his own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. And then he goes on to say, he wants us to obey his word and to trust it. Whenever your situation, child of God, individually in our situation, collectively, both as a church in this area, and indeed the nation, when we give our all to the Lord, he'll never fail us. 
1 Thessalonians 5, verse 24, it simply says, Faithful is he that calleth you, he also will do it. He's faithful. Are you willing to get? This woman, she went off. Tells us in verse 15, she went and she did according to the saying of Elijah. In other words, she went, she got him his drink of water, she also got him his meal. And she and he and her house did eat many days. The word for many days in the Hebrew is also translated a full year. And it's a full year before we come to what happens now to your son in verse 17. But for one full year, and yes, it, ha- it carried on, the Lord's promise didn't stop after a year, but for one year, just picture this before we go to this next part, when we come back to this study. One full year, every morning she got up out of bed, she went to the kitchen. Oh, there's the meal and there's the oil. We're going to have breakfast today. She came back at lunchtime. Oh, there's still meal, there's still oil. We're going to have lunch today. She came back in the evening time for dinner. There's still meal, there's still oil. We're going to have dinner tonight. And every single day and every single night, the food was still there. God doesn't fail. So why not trust him? Why not give him your heart? Why not give him your all? Let's bow in prayer as we close. Heavenly Father, we come to thee and Lord, we just rejoice in thy goodness and in thy mercy. We thank thee, O God, for salvation. We thank thee, O God, even for the possibility of even drawing nigh and having peace with thee through Christ. We thank thee for thy goodness, for thy faithfulness. Lord, for the truth that we can highlight and we can hold on to that our Lord never fails his people. He's faithful right to the end. God, even separate us now with thy blessing. Hide thy word deep in our hearts. Enable us, O God, as we go day by day to ever be relying and completely trusting upon thee and in no one else. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for coming. And we pray that the Lord will bless each one. And that the Lord will bless even this evening as well. And do remember, uh, as you leave, just